What's going on, guys? Let's get those glasses high in the sky. I, for one, am super glad it's Friday right for the weekend, and that can mean only one thing. It's time for Last Call. What's going on, guys? It is Brian and Jack with Simple Man's Comics. We do a lot of comic and pop culture content on this channel. So if you're new here, consider subscribing. This is the last call show where we're talking about all those comic books that are hitting final order cutoff. But we're going to highlight our 10 picks. The rest of the list you can find on simplemanscomics.com. But get those orders in before final order cutoff this coming Monday so you can secure your copy. And a lot of times get that pre-order discount but real quick, before we get into our picks tonight, you may have noticed that we just launched a brand new podcast. It's going to be an audio version. We will have the video up here on YouTube. That's going to be every other week from Tuesday nights. But the next one will hit March 10th, right, Jack? Yeah, we're really excited about it. Um, you know, we've been talking about doing this for a long time. And we told you guys in 2020, we were going to be bringing you guys a lot of new stuff. So be sure like Brian said, it's going to be hitting YouTube as well as the audio version. So be sure to hit that bell notification as well as be subscri subscribed to the channel so that you can get notified whenever new content hits the channel. Right. And again, that audio version is pretty much available everywhere. Podcasts are available on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and it goes on and on. With that being said, let's get into our 10 picks for Final Order Cutoff, starting with Hellions number one. This is from Marvel Comics, right? Yeah, and you know, this is one we got to talk about, but it, this one I don't think is really my pick per se. I think it's one, it's one of the 10 books of note, um, but not one that I'm overly excited about because, Brian, this is to me another X book. Uh, we're taking some of the kind of darker kind of troublemakers from the, the X-Men, um, I want to I say universe, kind of throwing them together in a team like we tend to do. And uh, in this book, Hellions, it's been kind of teased for a little while from Marvel, and uh, now it's hitting final order cut off. Yeah, I'm definitely not in this one, but there has gotten a lot of buzz around it. Yeah. I've been vocal on here before, but I'm not already, I'm not a big X-Men fan. And key factor of that is they keep putting out a bunch of different X-Men books. I'm of the opinion of less is more, just like Ross Ritchie said, let's have less releases. No need to have all these X-Men books. I understand the fans out there, and I understand people buying them. That's kind of why we're talking about it and get those pre-orders in, get that discount before final order cut off. Sumerian Queen of Black Coast number two. This comes from a Blaze comic. So you hear a lot of buzz about a Blaze lately with some great independent publishers out there. This is definitely one of them. And this is one book that I'm liking. First issue just co is coming out next week, March 4th. Be on the lookout for that. But we're talking about issue number two, Hitting Final Order Cutoff. If you like those Robert Reed Howard, those Conan-type stories, this is right in that universe. Definitely want to look at picking those up. And there's some great covers for this, aren't there, Jack? Yeah, this one really is a variant cover grab. There's some great covers uh, to pick from. And I think that those are going to get a lot of people's attention. Now, some context, though, to this book that I just found out that I find really interesting is the fact that this series existed in 2019, but was shut down by Diamond Comic Distributors after getting a cease and desist from Robert E. Howard's estate. Um, it's Robert E. Howard died some years ago, but these uh, Conan books, or the original Conan stories, have now hit public domain. And this specific story, the, the Black Coast story, was deemed legally uh, able to kind of be picked up by another publisher. Now, we've talked about this on the channel. I haven't heard a lot of comic uh, YouTubers talking about this, but we've kind of like posed the question, what's going to happen with Superman and Batman? And this is a prime example right here, Brian, where, you know, uh, maybe a, a larger uh, publisher like DC, they don't want to step on Marvel Marvel's toes by doing Conan books, but a Blaze Comics, they don't have a problem, and they'll come out with some cool variant covers, and I'm going to check this out because I'm curious to see what kind of a story this is in comparison to Conan. Mortal Hulk number 33. Now, it's been a few weeks since we've talked about a Mortal Hulk on this show, but 
this is a big issue. It's actually the 750th Incredible Hulk issue, right, Jack? Yeah, really, um, honestly, Immortal Hulk is ice cold. Uh, it, it's, it's a three down resident. It's, it's so down. We don't put it on three down because, you know, we've already talked about it being there and it's not going any further. Having said that, this is not about Immortal Hulk. This is about that legacy numbering, what you just said right there. This is Incredible Hulk number 750. And a lot of people don't realize that Marvel is still staying really true to that legacy numbering. That number in the corner kind of goes under the radar to the average collector, speculator, uh, reader. But Marvel is still very much attached to that numbering system. Um, I, I've been critical in the past that they did not do enough to support it. I've even said that, like, if I was Marvel, I would be encouraging retailers to have their back issue bins be organized based on the Marvel legacy numbering system, which would be out of out the traditional alphabetical order because you have to take mini series and mix them in with the traditional runs. But regardless, these moments, I think, are still going to hold out. I wish they would switch the numbering, like call it Immortal Hulk 750, uh, you know, call it whatever. Uh, call it Incredible Hulk, you know, colon Immortal Hulk. Do something. But um, I think DC gets these right with these big moments. And they do that switch, and they've got all the decade variants. But... You and I were just talking, um, there's, you know, a multitude of covers to this book, some 10 covers or something like that. And Definitely then, we have a favorite. Yeah, there's a ton of incentives that are going to get people's intention. But yeah, for me, and I think for you, it, it's that uh, Bennett homage, that uh, great, you know, homage to uh, Incredible Hulk 1. I think, uh, you know, Bennett gets some crap for some of his variant covers that he's done on this run. Um, but I think he really kind of hit a home run with this. And, and look, Hulk's been done before, right? Like, I mean, we've seen that done from a re retailer exclusive, but you got to cut Marvel some slack. Like, they, you know, they're allowed to pay tribute to their own greatness, um, you know, just because other retailers have done it. Shouldn't, doesn't mean they shouldn't do it. I think this, and I think this being a cover price book is even better because it'll be accessible. Yeah, especially since you can't name too many titles out there that have 750 issues. No. And here we're talking about No One's Rose number one. There's another indie comic coming from Vault Comics. This is going to have a couple of different covers for it, but just like we always talk about, there's actually an FOC variant. So you want to make sure if you want this, you get that order in before Monday night. Yeah, and Vol has a great reputation on the independent market, and they brought in both, he and I have talked openly that, you know, when Vol drops a new number one, we're usually gonna check it out and give it that first arc uh, test. Now, um, this one we're talking about kind of like a dystopian future type look. Uh, right off the bat, I like the color and everything, but the story doesn't necessarily look like my type of story, but I like some of the people involved. We've got Zach Thompson, we've got Raphael Albuquerque. Uh, this seems like some maybe larger names. I love the people who have worked with Vault. Um, we've got some great stories from Vault, and we've actually gotten to talk to some of the people from Vault. There's some great people involved. But this is the first time where I've seen uh, some names that I've seen work with the big two, um, some names who have done work on other uh, licensed properties and things like that, uh, coming and doing a independent creator-owned book with Vault. That is good to see. That is growth for Vault. Here's a book that's no stranger to this channel. We've talked about it in multiple videos. We've talked about it on Last Call. We even have separate videos for back issues to be on the lookout for. But here we are talking about Mighty Morphin Power Rangers number 49, Jack. Yeah, and this is one almost the issue that we've been waiting for. We've been talking about the climb to issue 50, this necessary evil storyline. But uh, I think this issue, we're going to start to get a uh, – a glimpse at where this story is going. And uh, we may just be getting the return of not necessarily the hero we want, but the hero we need. Right. And it's always important because we've talked about this on the channel too. Whenever you get like a monumental issue number 50, 100 or so forth, it's always likely that sometimes they try to sneak something in on that issue right before or right after. So that's why another reason why we like Mighty Morphin Power Rangers number 49 
for Fortnite or order cut off this week. Here we have two beloved franchises, especially from my childhood, but we're talking about Transformers versus Terminator number one, right? It's going to have that regular cover. It's going to have that cover B. It's going to have a Freddie Williams 1 in 10 variant, as well as a Francesco Francovia 1 in 25 variant. But we also want to mention one of our channel sponsors has that exclusive variant up there right now on SlabHeroes.com as well, right, Jack? Yeah, absolutely. It, it is amazing. Uh, I got to be honest with you, kind of confession time style here. I absolutely love these crossover series. I think for the most part, they are a lot of fun. And the people who write them aren't always the biggest names in the hobby, but they tend to be people who have a passion, passion. right, for the characters. And honestly, I'm really sitting back thinking about it. Nine out of 10 times, they're really great books. If you think about like, Batman, Ninja Turtles has been its stellar, exceptional. Ninja Turtles Power Rangers is even better. Um, you know, uh, Justice League and Power Rangers, Justice League and Black Hammer. Um, and it's cool also. He-Man and Injustice. Uh, you know, yeah, that one too. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's cool to see publishers working together, I think, as well. So we've seen IDW work with you know, DC Comics, we've seen them work with Boom Studios, um, and now we're seeing them work with uh, Dark Horse Comics, who we've seen Dark Horse Comics recently work with DC Comics. So it's really cool to see these companies working together and coming together. You know when it's even better, though, Brian, is when it somehow feels organic, because I remember when the first cover art image of this concept came out. And it started spreading around Instagram. And you know that we pay attention to social media because that social media buzz is the truest indicator of secondary market value today. And uh, I actually got a message from Mel V from the Mighty Mel V YouTube channel, writer from comicsheatingup.net, uh, hit me up and was like, is this real? Uh, because he was just so stunned and kind of like blown away that this could be cool because a lot of these mashups, they don't always feel organic. And one reason I was very excited about Power Rangers and Ninja Turtles is it did feel organic because these two had crossed over before on television. Well, with Transformers and Terminator, we're talking about machines. There's a commonality involved here. Um, Transformers and Ghostbusters may have been, say, a larger stretch. He, even though that I also enjoyed and thought was a cool, fun uh, book. But here we get um, something that I think is more adult themed, has a little bit more of that badass feel to it. Um, and let's be honest, like Transformers, it comes and goes. One time we talked about a Terminator comic. So this is kind of cool to have and uh, may reflect in some positive sales when for Dark Horse if they come out with a new Terminator series. Yeah, I'm excited for it. Like I said, it's two franchises that I grew up with, sneaking in, watching Terminator when your parents wouldn't let you. But either way, it's going to make for a great story. Robots and machines. I'm in for it. We need RoboCop next. Getting back over to Marvel, we have that Road to Empire Kree Scroll War number one, right? Normally, this is one of those books that I probably wouldn't pick up on, especially if it's leading up to that next event, Empire, right? Marvel's events, they've had some good ones, they've had some bad ones. Anything leading up to an event, sometimes I'm like, oh, hands off. But I think you're about to get into this a little bit, Jack, but I could see this also. We always talk about that MCU, we talk about that Kree Scroll War that in the MCU. So this might be something to play up later and worth picking up now. Yeah, we're definitely going to talk about that. But I also want to make a point on something else you said about these lead up issues. You know, a lot of people actually think like you do, where it's, you know, they don't want to be marketed to. They don't want the lead up issue. It doesn't seem to hold that value. But do you know that if you actually look on the secondary market, if a story pops, if, that's a big if, if a story pops, that lead up issue tends to be underprinted. Uh, it under it just under available and usually will pop on the secondary market. Um, we were just talking about Power Rangers a few a few books ago. Uh, thinking about uh, Shattered Grid, that monumental story that 
did so much on the secondary market. The prelude issue ended up being one of the most expensive issues in the entire run because of that. And so there's a potential for that here, but I have to be honest with you, and this goes towards what you were saying, which is I really don't know anybody who like, this is coming out of incoming and going into Empire. Uh, I don't know too many people who are excited for this, who I've heard talking about this. Now, when this was originally leaked, um, I don't remember what convention it was at, uh, you know, a year ago or so. And we still, and I say leaked, but when we started to get information about it, for, directly from Marvel, there was some excitement. There was some talk about, okay, who is this blacked out character on the cover and this, that, and the third. But this story has really gone on with a whimper. And I really think it's a little bit of absolute carnage exhaustion, but I just think it's, it's, it's poor timing. I think we need a break from these big crossover stories maybe for a little while. But the other part of what you brought up is the MCU tie-in. And this also ties into Reader Buzz. Tom King's vision run um, was amazing. And it kind of opened a lot of doors for this kind of story to be told. And a really underrated series is Meet the Scrolls. Now, it's, got, it's, it's had its day to get popular because the first appearance of the family, the Warners, and some of the variant covers. But we know that the Scrolls and the Kree, if you know anything about Marvel Comics, you know, this is an epic war. This is Hatfield McCoy's level. Um, we're talking two entities that just, two, two races that just do not exist well and are constantly at war. And we are going to see that play out in the MCU at some point. Um, we've already seen it through Captain Marvel, but we're going to see it on a larger scale. And the Kree Scroll War has been told in comics over the years, but in modern times, we're seeing it told through the eyes of this kind of scroll family who we tend to feel some sympathy for the warners and that's who this book focuses on as this war is erupting as empire is kind of upon us and i i think from that angle you never know what could happen in this book i also think that if the warners as kind of has been rumored become a family that we actually see say on disney plus or in the movies anything with them in it and it's not a ton 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 of books would be something to keep an eye out for. You mentioned Power Rangers and how that prelude book popped. Power Rangers doesn't have like seven events going on each year and half of them sucking. It's Marvel true. does. These prelude books, we've heard that same thing, especially with those MCU movies and how Marvel puts those prelude books out. Prelude to Avengers Affinity War, prelude to Spider-Man, prelude to this. And everyone talks about how low printed those are and to pick them up and then you see a short pop on them. And then the movie comes and goes, and then those prelude issues you can find in sidewalk sales, dollar bin boxes. I'm sitting this one out. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but this isn't one that hits my radar. Then getting back over to that smaller press with Valiant. We're talking about Exo Man of War. We've talked about on this channel before how Valiant is, what is it called? The Year of the Hero, where they're having new number ones each month? Yeah, and this month, we're not throwing out a minor character. We're throwing out a major character with Exo Man of War. This is one of their, if you were to imagine kind of their trinity, this is one of theirs. This is Iron Man. This is, um, this is a, a really a legacy character for Valiant, a character who has kind of been one of the uh, flagship characters throughout the, the history of Valiant Comics. Um, there's a, like most number ones, we get a, a multitude of covers. Um, obviously, Brian, you and I have talked about those uh, Variant Bundle covers, the pre-order bundles. Be sure to check those out. Uh, I talk about them all the time, but I want to highlight them again. Uh, you got to get into your LCS. Usually your LCS will actually have a slip that you can fill out that Valiant mails comic shops. Um, you, you can fill it out. If not, you just contact them. They can take care of it for you. Um, you commit to buying the first four issues. I don't know. Your shop may want to deposit, may not. Um, they just want you to you know, put the first four on your pull. Once so they, this one looks, sorry not to cut you off, but I was just thinking this one looks different. It might be more, it's looking like this is a pre-order of one through 12, not one through four. So how many people are going to do that? 
Yeah, and that's even better. And I see again, I like that. And that's what I have done is at any Valiant uh, series that I enjoy, that's what I've done is I've collected those pre-ordered bundle variants. And that's kind of my thought is it, if Valiant has its day, like I hope it will one day, um, those pre-order ones are going to be tough. And then we always talk about the high ratio one. Um, Valiant does these amazing high ratio books. They do one for every number one. Um, every major number one there's some of the minor ones they haven't and what they try to do is incorporate some material it's usually it's very gimmicky but it's gimmicky on purpose and you know like how sometimes something is like corny but corny intentionally and can be so corny it's cool it's that kind of thing so it's not uh it's not a gimmick for gimmick's sake so or, or maybe it is and that's what works about it so we've seen them use carbon fiber we've seen them use uh, and I'm talking about an actual carbon fiber comic uh, with Bloodshot. We saw them use fiberglass. We've seen them uh, have a flocked comic for all my Funko fans. Uh, you know, we've seen them do uh, color form comics. We've seen all kinds of different things. And here we are actually getting a bronze metal comic. So I imagine that's just going to be incredible. I have started to piece together a couple of these high ratio valiant variants i would love to build a collection but to be honest with you it's tough we're living in a world where high ratio variants brian we've talked about this before just really don't hit ratio price a lot of times half ratio is about the best you can hope these valiant variants frequently go above ratio so if you know a shop that has that bronze metal variant um, and they're willing to sell that at or below ratio that is something i'd be on the lookout for yeah, I personally, out of all those covers, one of my favorites just from the art. I'm a big Jeff DeCall fan, and that cover B has a gorgeous Jeff DeCall cover. And sticking with the Indian small press, we're going right over to Archie Comics with a brand new series on Super Duck number one. This has some great covers for it. Looks like a great premise. This is also a book that's perfect for this video because we don't see a lot of people pay attention to Archie Comics. Because we don't see a lot of people pay attention to Archie Comics, especially something like this that might probably get some buzz on release. Yeah, this is a character that's actually existed within the Archie universe since 1943. So we're talking about golden age character. Um, but this isn't the, the, the super duck that you have seen in the past. This is a kind of a, a new kind of inclination of this character. We've got Ian Flynn, who has been uh, the kind of the mastermind behind the Sonic the Hedgehog comic for the last of teen issues for uh, IDW. And we've also got Frank Thierry, who's known for his kind of adult and really kind of violent graphic work. And so you may say, well, what are they doing on an Archie book for with Super Duck? Well, that's because this book is really aimed towards a more adult audience. Think Howard the Duck. That seems to be what we're going to get with this book. Seems maybe a little odd coming from Archie, but you got to think about what they were able to do with kind of the Archie afterlife yeah, or the Mark Wade movement. Archie, right? Right. They've really been able to take their books that were once geared towards a real kind of 1950s soda pop shop kind of, um, you know, real G-rated lifestyle and adapt them to the modern market. And while this one's out there, no doubt, and this is actually one I would keep an eye out for. There's a few variant covers for it. Um, and I, I'm curious to read it. Is it any good? I really don't know what to expect for a kind of retread golden age character. This could be absolute gold, or this could just be some ridiculous book. And you really don't know, but it's definitely one I'm going to check out. And definitely one I'm intrigued by. And you're absolutely right, Brian. It's one people aren't going to talk about. And it's why we have this show because we get to highlight books like this if you don't let your lcs know you want some of these covers i assure you this isn't one you're just going to find on the shelf and be on the lookout for those stores that accidentally throw this on the kids rack being that it's an archie comics publication yeah i look at it as super low risk right it costs you the price of a red bull yep. so if you want the issue pre-order and you might get a discount not to mention you want to pre-order because if your lcs doesn't carry it you find out later that you want to get it. You're going to hear a lot of people go, hey, Archie's website has it for cover price. Fire be warned because their shipping sucks. Yes. We're talking brown bag. Unbagged and boarded in a brown bag. Good luck. Um, I've been there. I've done it. 
Uh, I've bought them knowing how bad it was because a book was just that hot. And then I've never, ever been satisfied with a purchase from Archie's web store. And you know that we are advocates of shopping from the web stores, but Archie Comics, you guys got to step that game up. And the last book we're going to talk about tonight isn't even a single issue. We are talking about a trade paperback, and we're also talking about one of the favorite series we've talked about on the show. We've had the creators on here before to interview it right before it was released, and we're talking volume one of Canto. Yeah, now we don't usually talk about trade paperbacks on this show. We know that that's not necessarily what a lot of you out here are are here for, but let me explain why first. Number one, we've talked about Canto um, over the last year a lot, and we know that maybe some people were slow to jump on board. And then we also know that those back issues have become increasingly difficult to pick up with issue number one selling for over $30 at this point. So we thought this would be a good time to highlight a couple things. Number one, that um, trade paperback the trade paperback is now available. It's coming up for order on FOC. Now is the time to put that order in. And it, it's not one that I expect a lot of LCSs to like stock six to 10 on the shelf. Um, they're probably going to get one or two. They'll definitely order it because it was popular, but you're not going to get a ton. So you want to put that order in, but also it's, it's a $20 book. And these are the types of books where uh, being that they, the LCS can reorder them. It's not like comics where once it's gone, it's gone. They have a larger tendency to throw you a nice discount. So many of you can get this book for 15, 13, check DCBS, check all those other online uh, service in stock trades, check all those places out. Um, you, you should be able to find a discount for it. But you know, if you missed it and you wanted to check out what Brian and I have been talking about for the last year, this is an absolutely great opportunity because it's, it's a perfect time. Maybe you're an investor and you're like, ah, I'm not the biggest reader. Okay, maybe you didn't invest in, in Canto. And we're about to start talking about the second arc of Canto. And we're going to have another interview. Brian told you guys about the, uh, the interview that we have with Drew Zucker and David Boer right here on the channel. But we have another one on the way. We're about to record it within the next week. So it is coming. And the next arc is going to get people talking about Canto again. So maybe if you want to evaluate whether or not you wanted to get involved in this book from an investment standpoint, reading that trade is absolutely invaluable. But also, guys, we just love this story and we really think that this is a, a great story, one that you'll enjoy. So we want to really advocate for it. Also, and I think it's great to read with, if you have kids, it's one of those books yeah. that's perfect to read with your kids. Yeah, my whole family read it. And I think that it's a story um, to where... I think it's going to hold up over time. And we've talked about the, 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 our belief that this could end up being a movie one day. Um, so get in on it early. But here's the other thing. We also wanted to highlight that trade paperbacks come available on FOC. We talk about it every week. Brian mentions it. I hear him say it every week. I don't know if you guys are listening, but simplemanscomics.com, the website, the home base of Brian and I, uh, it, it has a lot of resources and things that we don't always get promote or pitch right here on, on the various shows on the YouTube channel. But one of those things is that FOC list that is on the website, that last call FOC list, it is far more comprehensive than what we talk about on the show. We just pick out 10 books. It lists every single comic that releases on FOC. It has it on the website, but also it has trade paperbacks. Um, so this is just an example of the dozens of trades that become available every week. And it also has toys. It has uh, all the items that Diamond Comic Distributors uh, has on their FOC program. So there's a lot of unique models and um, sometimes trading cards. Uh, I know a lot of you guys are into uh, sports cards. We've seen Topps Baseball was on the FOC list. So, you know, things like that. Uh, we want to make sure you guys are aware of that because it's a great opportunity to use that website as a weekly tool to see what you can put your order in and maximize your discounts. We're trying to look out for you guys. So yes, if you want to see that full FOC list, make sure you check out some events, But like we always do after our picks, we talk about those additional prings that are coming out, right, Jack? Definitely. And small list this week, but we've got a few for you. Marvel is coming with Hawkeye Free Fall number three, the second print. There's definitely some growing reader buzz on that series. We've also got Thor number one, the second print. Not surprised to see that. I'm waiting on that number two second print. And we've got Copper number one, the second print from Image Comics. So be on the lookout for those late printings hitting FOC this week. 
So there it is. That's our 10 picks plus additional printings. Also check out simplemanscomics.com. But again, like we talked about at the beginning of the show, we have that new podcast, Simple Man's Comics and Friends. Make sure you guys check that out on this channel or check out the audio version. This is Brian Jack with Simple Man's Comics. We'll see you guys in the next video.